Welcome, everybody. Uh, as I was saying, it is a very exciting time at the moment, I feel. Uh, a period really of transition at the moment. Huge amounts has changed in the last decade with regard to the way that the world thinks about E and S and G, broad sustainability issues. And I think we, we, can, we can see this in the fact that we're getting on for nearly a trillion dollars invested in broad ESG products today. Uh, and in fact, it feels to me like we've moved from famine to feast in terms of data availability, data analytics, the number of groups that are offering to hoover up data from your businesses and, and then uh, provide all sorts of analysis to you. So it, enormous things going on. And, and I think E and S and G mean very different things to, to different people and to different businesses. So I thought we might just start off by hearing from each of you uh, just a little bit about your businesses. I think your businesses will be very known, very well known to most people, so very, very brief introduction. Um, but then more to the point, what you actually, what, what E and S and G means to each of you and to your businesses. So maybe Louise, at, at the end, perhaps you could just uh, kick us off. So the, the small questions then, to start with. Uh, absolutely, okay. yeah, start with the little ones. We'll get bigger okay. for a so, minute, don't um, So I uh, work for Hammerson, and uh, uh, people will probably be aware of the business, but we own um, uh, large retail um, assets, shopping centres across the UK, France, Ireland, and, and um, have investments in retail outlets across continental Europe. So we're a very retail-focused business. Um, we've been around for a long time, and Hammerson's, I've been with Hammerson for over six years now, and my predecessor was, was with Hammerson for probably seven years before I was. So Hammerson has had a very, very strong sustainability strategy for a very long time. We're a long-term holder of assets, and the business worked out a long time ago that um, if it's going to continue to hold assets, they are going to be, we're going to be impacted by climate change. Uh, and by the, the, the sustainability agenda that was developing all of those years ago, they just needed to work out what that was. Um, and they made a very strong commitment to do that then, and that's continued through, throughout. So f for us, and I think for any business, su sustainability, um, it's, you need to understand what the really material impact that sustainability have for you. So for us, um, sustainability and our material impacts are, are about the energy demand that runs through our shopping centers. Um, we, have to, we, we have a fairly large um, uh, electricity demand. As I always say, it's quite difficult to shop without the lights on. Um, so we have a big electricity demand, and that's the biggest challenge that we have. That's one of our biggest risks. We don't have a huge amount of physical climate risk um, because of where the assets are located. So, but those are the, the areas that, the, the, that we look at. Um, for other businesses, it will be different. We, have a, a, we, we do a lot of development, so there's, there's uh, the, the, the environmental factors in terms of um, the materials that we use. We then, in terms of the social impacts, we have a big community engagement program because our assets need to be in, in, in areas where, which are thriving. So we are very important to those areas. We need to make sure that people keep having a reason to come to our assets, to use our assets, to visit them for whatever's going on there. So we need a very strong relationship with that community. So there's all sorts of very good reasons why we would cover um, the environmental and social areas of sustainability. When it comes to kind of the, the separation between sustainability and trying to differentiate between sustainability and ESG, um, I think ESG has started to allow us to really kind of codify sustainability as businesses. So it begins to allow us to have a conversation internally with my governance, with our governance teams and our finance teams about actually the, the, ele the different elements and the different ways in which that becomes reported. So sustainability is there, it's broad, it will be different for different businesses. ESG just begins to en enable us to articulate it more clearly, I think. Okay, that's great, thanks. And, and Brian, how about you? I'm a CEO of a company called Shaftesbury. We're based here in the West End of London. Uh, we've, over the last 30 odd years, put together a portfolio of nearly 600 buildings here in the West End. Uh, but they're generally very old and very small. So we think the average age of our buildings is about 150 years. So it's part of the uh, heritage and historical heart of the West End of London. Um, we've, I suppose we've always thought that probably the most sustainable thing you can do is not pull down buildings. The embedded energy in buildings is huge. Uh, but we've created a sort of industry where, you know, not just the investment industry, but it's all about pulling old buildings down and putting up new buildings. Well, you've got a classic example here of a building that was probably built in the 20s, I guess, still in use today. If you look at the new office of the Mayor of London, is that going to last 30 years? It look, it's look, looking partially redundant now. So I think we've got to think long term. And I suppose in Shaftesbury, we've always tried to have 
a long-term responsible view. It's been a long-term strategy. Our skill is in maintaining these buildings that we own, this odd collection of buildings, uh, making them not just environmentally sustainable, but economically sustainable as well, i.e. how to use the space in the buildings. They're surprisingly adaptable. Uh, our, our focus is making them interesting, so actually like a shopping centre, you've got to want people to carry on using the areas and using the buildings. Uh, but think how we adapt rather than rip down. So um, it, that's always been our long-term focus. Um, I suppose really, you, you could say, talking about ESG, what does it mean? Well, they're letters, you know, is the E ethical or environmental? Uh, is the, the, the G governance or green? Is the, the S is social and society, really? So it means lots of things. But I think probably what sits over the top of this is responsible long-term stewardship of a business. And how do we achieve that aim in a world that, you know, I'm afraid is notoriously short-term in its outlook? It's great to produce an annual report. It measures your financial progress over 12 months. It in no way attempts to assess your long-term environmental impact and your impact on society, things like that. So I think we've got to think about broadening out what constitutes success in a, certainly in a listed company. And part of that involves investors playing their part as well, I think. Uh, they need to challenge management about what they're doing. They need to know that we all need to know we're investing in assets that still will be around in 50 or 100 years' time. That's the ultimate sustainability. But then from there, it's a mindset, it's an attitude, it's having the right sort of governance procedures that means you, you do focus on the long term, not the short term game. That's always the temptation. Great, thanks. And we'll come back to investors and to other stakeholders in a little while, I'm sure, in our discussions. But um, for now, Biliana, perhaps you could just tell us what, uh, what it means to you and, uh, and Kungsleden. Yes, so um, I'm CEO of Kungsleden, and Kungsleden is a Swedish-listed real estate company. Uh, we are focusing on offices, uh, and we do own uh, 200 properties, uh, 37 billion Swedish crowns value. Um, we are actually also celebrating 20 years as EPRA is this year. Uh, so we have been in the market for a long time and we have a long-term perspective in everything that we do. Um, uh, sustainability for us uh, is very important. It's uh, a part of our everyday business. Uh, sustainability is included in our vision actually. Uh, and our vision is to create attractive and sustainable places that enrich people, that inspire people. And for us at Kungsleden, and this actually involves everyone in Kungsleden, uh, it's about the planet, it's about the people, and it's about profitability. Um, a year ago, which is quite recent, when I spoke with one of my colleagues in the industry about our sustainability initiatives, uh, the feedback was, oh, it only costs money. And it doesn't. It's really about being long-term, and it, it is truly profitable in many ways. Um, we have, uh, I mean, it's very broad ESG, uh, and we have just decided upon that we will focus on five areas. And that's about environment, energy consumption reduction, uh, uh, to certify our, all of our properties to be green in all ways, to offer our tenants green leases, etc. It's about social responsibility to give back uh, to the society, especially where we are present. It's about health and safety, uh, not only with our, only our employees, but also our tenants' employees, everyone that we work with. It's about people. Um, it's about business ethics, uh, to do right, always. Uh, and, uh, and the last part is, of course, gender equality and diversification within our company. And we only do that because we believe that all of this will do us more profitable than if we don't work with that. And, and that's, a, that's a very important point. We're going to come to that in just a, a moment. But actually, I wanted to just draw out one aspect of what you've all touched on, in a sense, which is, which is people and your own people, but the people also who, who use your, your properties. Yesterday, I visited the Thames Tideway project, the, the super sewer that's being built under the River Thames, an, an unbelievable uh, project. Um, what was interesting in the particular site that I visited is that they have 3,000 construction workers on site and obviously they have lots of, uh, lots of health and safety rules, they have lots of physical first aiders. But what really interested me is that they have over 100 mental health first aiders. In fact, they have more mental health first aiders than physical first aiders. 
And I just, I just thought just, we just might touch on that and whether in your own organizations you have any programs to actually uh, address people's mental health uh, alongside physical health. I don't want to go, go down a sort of a rabbit warren because there's lots of other things to talk about, but that really sort of prompted a reaction in me yesterday when I discovered that. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it, it, it's a really pertinent issue. And uh, we had a session a couple of weeks ago uh, in the office on specifically on mental health and mental well-being. Um, and uh, we have mental health first aid of training for, for, for our teams within the business. Um, so it's very much something that's, that's live and, and just something that, that people are encouraged increasingly to be able to talk about. As a sector, we have really poor outcomes and results in terms of um, mental health um, for, for, for people who are working in our sector. And I think it's something that actually does need a lot more attention being paid to it. Just, um, and just it's gone to jump incredibly in well with our internal teams. Yeah, well, construction workers yeah. uh, are, are at three times the risk of suicide yeah. compared to the average in the United Kingdom, which yeah. was a statistic that shocked it's me. Really, it's really shocking. And if you, you start to think about the fragmentation of that industry and the, and the way in which labor is managed within that industry, you can start to see why. Um, and that's, that's something that I know I do quite a lot of work with, um, with MACE, and I know it's something that they take incredibly seriously across, across their sites. There is quite a lot of work going on, but we've got a long way to go, I think, in addressing and, it. And not to make light, but you've, you've used the word conservative, so sometime in the panel we will have to use the words liberal, uh, democratic. And, uh, <laughs> sorry, did I? And, I don't uh, remember uh, saying and, that and, word. And talk about <laughs> labour a little later, just for balance, obviously. Anyway, sorry, Brian, I think maybe yeah. you were going to add something. Uh, well, I was just add something to that, and uh, looking around, I'm the most ancient person in the room, I can guarantee that, because I I am these days, but uh, I started work in 1973, and I cannot tell you how much the working environment has changed over that time. And I'm afraid some of it's not for the better. The pressure on people at work these days is huge. Some of it's because of technology. You actually, you know, we all in our lives, you, can, you can't escape it. You can't escape work. You can't go home on a Friday evening. Work is never that far behind because it sits in your pocket on your mobile phone or wherever. So we have to be conscious of the pressures on people in the workplace. So. Yes, thinking about how people, we can use technology to help people work more flexibly, give them more time to themselves. But also remember these mental health issues and challenges don't stop with them. Sometimes they're in their families. Young people growing up have huge issues these days at school, partly because of the thing we carry around in our pocket. I suspect that you can't ever escape your problems and it's always with you. So it's taking a much broader view. And I mean, the most, we always say, our most valuable asset, we don't have a big team of people at Charles Bee, but are our people and the knowledge and experience. So we've got to help them find a way through all of this. They'll work better and you know, the business will be better if people have a bit of clear space, headspace, and come into work you know, in the right sort of frame of mind in the morning. Great, thank you. Biliana, anything to add? Others, we're going to move on to a, a harder edge subject of risk and return. No, I'm fine. Right. I, I, okay. tot well, I totally agree. And I, I, I can just uh, uh, comment on the stress because I think that is a, a huge problem uh, today within the society and all companies. We actually measure stress uh, in our company, how our employees uh, are feeling. And uh, on average, 5 to 8% of all people that work within Kungsleden are stressed. Mm -hmm. And that's a very high number. And if we look... Uh, uh, we have a, a decreasing amount of, of uh, sick uh, leaves in, in Kungsleden, but the number who go on sick leave because of stress and, and mental issues are increasing. So this is really a huge problem, and uh, the, the business and different businesses have to find a way to deal with all this. Yeah, well, indeed, and that, that's a, a great sort of segue actually to risk and return, because actually these things are all risks. I, I think intuitively it seems pretty obvious to me that they're all risks. But I just wonder more explicitly whether you could talk to this, this question which, which I still face uh, regularly from investors as to whether these broad uh, sustainability stroke E and S and G factors actually go to returns. Uh, well, I think that the people are, the pen is dropping. I think people are realizing that short term returns are one thing. <laughs> but is this performance sustainable? And as soon as people look at a business and look beyond its latest set of results and ask themselves about its sustainability, it is gonna affect their perception of the business and the value of the business to an investor. So I think we can't, people are just coming to understand that mm. because the world is changing very quickly and businesses that don't adapt won't be there for very long and that will soon have an impact on the money you've invested in that business. I yeah, think. no, I, I think it does. And I think, I mean, there's a, there's a very kind of direct relationship. I mean, I, I started doing work on looking at the relationship between 
more sustainable buildings and, and calculations of worth and the, the impact that climate change and sustainability was likely to have on, on investments over time. And we started doing the, that work 15 and 16 years ago. And came to the conclusion quite rapidly that if, you're, if your building was, was not of the right standard, you would start to suffer in terms of um, your, your income growth just wouldn't be as good as you were anticipating that it, you were expecting it to be, and your depreciation rates were going to rise, and it was going to hit your bottom line. Um, and that's sort of, that's come to fruition. I think we've seen, certainly in the office market, we've, st we've come to see a, a, a point where if you, are, if you are going to try and let a building into, a, into an international market and into a prime market, you're going to have to make sure that that building is, 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 is up to those standards. And those buildings that were built maybe 10 years ago just aren't going to cut it anymore, which brings us to another problem, which is the problem that you raised earlier about we've got an awful lot of buildings that we're going to have to do something with, and if we start tearing them down, we're just making the problem worse. <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's quite a big... And this, we sort of came up with the uh, Epic Sustainability Committee meeting yesterday. There is quite a big kind of elephant in the room about all of the carbon we've got within, embodied carbon within buildings that we're not really addressing properly yet. And you have it all banked in your estate. It's, it's spades. We have it in You know, you, uh, and so you, actually we need to be thinking about what we do with those assets. And it's not so, just sorry, tearing kind of buildings down, I've, is it? I mean, it's, it, it's yes. you know, tenant turnover and all those yeah. fit outs. You know, if we're moving to shorter leases, shorter tenant yeah. formats yes. within shopping centres, for example, or, or, yes. or, or, or so the streets yeah. of London, yeah. that's And the shopping centres are kind impacting. of, you know, obviously there's a kind of wider issue around shopping centres and what happens to shopping centres, but the, the, the kind of the, the fit out process and the changing of those processes is sort of manageable. It's not mm. quite so, so grotesque as, you, you've got a building, you mentioned county, the, the new county hall building. Well, actually, that's, that will probably get taken down yes. way before this one, and the, and the capital lump of carbon that happens mm -hmm. there will be significant. So we, you, we need to start thinking about it slightly differently, but to go sort of to your point about the, 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 the risk and return, that pre presents a risk because your building is just simply not going to be lettable, and you will suddenly have a big capital expenditure that you weren't thinking, thinking you were going to have. But then we're starting to see just the operating costs. I mean, last year, well, over the course of 2019, we estimate that we've taken about a million pounds out of the running costs of the shopping centres across the portfolio through energy savings. I mean, that's a fairly straightforward number. Wow. And that's, uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's who, who wants charge, to capitalise that? I'll, I'll, I'll start the bidding at, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe five times on that. Maybe someone else will uh, bid up. Uh, Biliana. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, we see clearly that our operation and maintenance costs have been reduced uh, by uh, these initiatives within sustainability, by initiatives with reducing energy consumption. We have invested in geothermal heating, for example, some of our properties, solar panels, etc. All that is reducing our operating costs. But on top of that, we have tenants in Sweden that will actually pay extra to, uh, be, uh, to lease premises in a green building. So, and uh, we see tenants that will not lease premises if the building is not yeah sustainable uh, and, and this is developing very very rapidly and I think the third part we mustn't forget it's about employees uh, when I talk to young people just out from university applying for the first job and they come to us and I ask why why have you chosen Kungsley and why don't you go to anyone else because there is lack of educated people within real estate and they say two things it's about your company's core values, and it's about your sustainability work. We truly believe that you are doing this for real. Uh, I mean, 25 years ago, if we were doing the same interview, it's about the company, the title, and the salary. That was the, you know, the, the, the most important things. Today, it's something else. And this is developing also very rapidly. So it's about our clients, our customers, it's about our employees, and it's about investors as well. I mean, we issued uh, two years ago uh, Sweden's largest green bond, uh, and uh, we got investors that never invested in Kungsleden before, uh, and, and the pricing was at least 10 to 15 basis points cheaper than if it had been a brown bond, so to say. So in, I can give you m lots of examples how this is actually profitable for a company. Yeah, very uh, interesting. I was just going to say the key thing here is actually our customers are expecting us to do more. Mm. Our customers, our occupiers, tenants, whatever you call them, they're expecting more because it goes down the chain. So for, I'm sure you're seeing it in shops and restaurants as we do, but mm. their the, customers 
are becoming more environmentally concerned, particularly younger people uh, who want to see, uh, they want to support things they consider to be ethical in their outlook yeah. and view. Um, so, you know, we're as landlords have got to do lots of things. Yeah. I mean, if, if you come to Carnaby this year, you might, our Christmas decorations look a little bit odd, but it's, we've, we've teamed up with a, uh, an ocean sustainability charity working with our restaurateurs to think about sustainability in our oceans. 80% of the planet's water, you know. So you can't ignore this. But actually, people are thinking very broadly about that. We need to think as broadly as well. We do. In places like Carnaby, there's a, there's a massive footfall. They're, they're huge in terms of being able to get that message and get people to, under, to understand it. There's massive opportunity for it as well. Great. OK, so it seems pretty conclusive, according to all of us anyway, that it goes to returns and actually must go to, to risk if people are bidding up bonds, bidding down the yields and bonds, then it's going, going to risk. And we're not here to talk about to, uh, me and my organization, but uh, just, just to sort of tell you oh, a little, go on. just a tiny <laughs> bit, well, just a tiny bit. We've, no, just, been, we've been advertising, you yeah. might Well, this is, this is, this is in, in no way an advertisement. I'll get a slap on the wrist for that. But we look at the returns, but we also look at risk. We build up a cost of equity for every single company, and that's how we discount the future returns that we forecast. And E and S and G are actually a very specific group of risks that we use to build up that cost of equity. So poor performance in terms of the E, the S, or the G adds to risk or reduces risk. So it changes the discount rate that we're applying to your company. So, so for us, as I say, and, and the investors who invest via us, it absolutely goes to, to, uh, to, to the returns, to the value that we won't recognize in your businesses. But that's that kind of, well, we could have a long conversation about other types of other sectors, couldn't we, and how that plays out for other sectors, because that's where potentially there's much bigger risk, isn't that? Uh, absolutely, absolutely, no, that's absolutely right. Um, Louise, you and actually we've all touched on this building, actually. It's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Now, this is, a, this is a listed building, and I suspect that it's within a conservation area perhaps as well. Um, it brings us to the subject of regulation. Because one of the reasons, perhaps, that this building has not been torn down, has been put to different uses, is that you're not allowed to, to tear it down. Uh, I question whether the new uh, City Hall, County Hall, will, mm. will be listed in, in due course. So I suppose it, it raised in my mind a question of what part regulation, government intervention, either locally or, or nationally, might play, and how you think about that. I mean, are any of your shopping centres likely to be uh, listed over the next few years? Well, I mean, Victoria Quarter in, in Leeds, the, the parts that are listed, it's a 19th century ar uh, arcade, it's a beautiful, beautiful building. Um, I, and I don't know the answer to that question. I, I, I suspect there won't be restrictions on more modern assets, some of them will get will be, but I think the restrictions aren't necessarily about listing. I think the restrictions will come about just the use of materials, and it will be relatively quickly. You know, if you look at we sort of starting to sort of look at climate scenarios and things over the next sort of 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and you start to actually look at what that means for construction materials you're just not going to be able to, to, to use them. We're not going to be able to. Concrete is something like represents something like 8% of carbon emissions across the planet at the moment. That's just, you just can't keep building in that way. So even if they do, whether or not they're listed, the value of the materials in them will make it incredibly difficult to, you know, to do anything with them, to start taking them down and start demolishing them, to, 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 to start doing demolition. We'll start thinking, I, I would imagine, about buildings, the physical structure buildings, in a very different way. And we need to start thinking about that now in terms of, and, and, and indeed some people are starting to think properly about actually how do you make buildings that you know that you can take down easily and, and will be much more flexible and that you can effectively reuse. Well, um, <laughs> It Most of your assets must be. Well, <laughs> we've got 20% 20, 20, 20 of our buildings are listed. Uh, you can imagine, you can imagine that's, you know, that reflects their age, really. And all of our buildings are in conservation areas. And uh, we work mostly within uh, the city of Westminster, so one local authority. Um, and I have to use the C word again. They're rather conservative <laughs> in their outlook, not just their politics. So actually, and the reality is, if we want to make these old buildings, if we want to preserve them, we're going to have to compromise a little bit. Um, so, you know, you won't see any PV cells on old buildings in, in the West End. You won't even see double glazing. They're obsessed with timber window frames. I live in Westminster. I can't have proper double glazing because I'm in a conservation. This is all madness, really. The climate 
must come first, I think. We must be doing the right thing. But regulate, joining up uh, regulators to think about these older buildings and, you know, we can't all have all the things we want. If we're going to deal with some of these problems, it requires compromise and giving up some of the things you like to have. And you can change old buildings without wrecking them. Absolutely. Yeah. They can't be beyond the wit no. of man to actually create no. a, a, a double glazed window that would be okay. And, and exactly. we're, 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 we're talking very sort of locally about listing yeah. here in the UK, but um, I think many of us think of uh, Sweden as, as being sort of actually more advanced in terms of uh, sustainability thought processes and also regulation. Is there more regulation? at the, the state level in Sweden and, and actually do you think that's a good thing? I mean there's always lots of um, you know, new regulation comes in and there's all sorts of accusations about the nanny state. Well I think you know many people brought up thinking that nannies were a, a good thing in looking after children so perhaps actually the nanny state should, should be more encouraged rather than abused. Um. Well, I think that uh, regulation will not solve anything. Uh, it can create a lot of problems uh, uh, and it can be good as well. So it's, it's important that it's balanced. I think what we have seen in Sweden is a huge trend uh, towards sustainability uh, from companies, from people, from students everywhere. And I think that is the big movement. Uh, a lot of uh, real estate companies uh, are certifying their properties and in order to certify your property you have to achieve certain results you know about everything from electricity energy consumption the material used how much waste uh, uh, is there how do people uh, that are working in your office building for example uh, getting to job etc uh, and, and this is a very strong trend. Uh, so having green buildings, having certified buildings, is something that is growing rapidly within our industry. And I think that is the main force behind the sustainability progress in Sweden today. Um, I, don't, I, I, I strongly believe that uh, if you get everyone engaged in these questions, then the big results come. It shouldn't be just from the top management or a head of sustainability or from regulators. It should be involving everyone, and then you have good results, I think. Sure, but I mean, wouldn't having a sort of a level playing field in terms of regulation, either at a national level or at an international level, ensure rather sort of fairer competition and sort of bring up the overall sort of base level. I mean, we can see at an international level the debates that go on just between countries and the different attitudes that are taken by the United States, for example, versus, versus other countries. I think, yeah, I mean, I think in order to resolve the climate change kind of emergency, that challenge that we've got, there will have to be much greater geopolitical agreement because you, it's, it's very difficult to do it on your own. Um, and yes, there does need to be some level of play, um, uh, some leveling of the play, playing field, particularly around carbon, because that's the big one that we keep we kind of addressing. But the emissions are still going up. I mean, that that was out over the last couple of weeks. The emissions are still rising. We're working hard. We're trying to trying to move things in the right direction, but it's still climbing. And there has to be a much more concerted effort at, a, at an international level. And we can't. It's hard to do that without the, the, the bodies and the structures set up to arrange it and, and a really meaningful engagement with them. And yes, there are challenges, particularly, obviously, as you've alluded to in the States now about the, 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 their approach. But some of that is, um, you know, maybe time limited and attitudes change. Um, but, you know, there are very good reasons why China wants to reduce emissions. They're concerned about the, being able to provide water for, their, for the entire population. So there are big global reasons why that will happen. Um, and I think at a local level, you, you need to get your own house in order and sort of keep moving in the right direction. Regulation will help and, and, and the political, uh, we do have a very strong direction in terms of politics in the UK, even if there's, there's a kind of nonsense that goes on on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. We have the Climate Act, we have a lot of people who are just, and, and businesses who are demanding that we move in one direction. We know where we're going with this. And it's brought a lot of really good change. Our, the grid in the UK is one of the cleanest. It's, it's really moved rapidly. So, so I think there is a certain, there is a level of consensus, but there needs to be more. And you can't just sort of go, well, America's not doing anything, so therefore we may as well throw up our hands. It's, it's, it doesn't work like that. 
I think you're absolutely right. We've, we've all got to do something. There's no magic bullet to any of these problems. Uh, but I'm slightly less optimistic about our political leaders and you know, whether they take a long-term view about anything at the moment. Uh, not that I'm coloured by our current general election, but uh, you sort of despair. Really. I wasn't really optimistic about them. I just kind of ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> but I think actually... You know, it's great they'll come up with a great idea. They're all going to be well, net carbon neutral or net carbon zero by 2050 without really thinking about what that means. That'll be somebody else's problem because they won't be around. But I think, in a way, they're, they're going to push that responsibility down the chain. So I think we as landlords need to remember there's a lot coming our way. You know, we're going to be the policemen for all of this. So it would, you know, we should all be thinking about this and as an industry work together to perhaps create our own standards below the government standards so it makes it easier for people to recognise buildings which, which uh, you know, are sustainable and do the right things as against those who don't. That would be a good start. But also I think we're rapidly realising that our, our impact on the world around us is as nothing compared to what our tenants get up to. So the next thing is to be more engaged with the people who use our buildings. I think that's the way the government is going to push us. It's going to say, great, shift the responsibility onto somebody else. You know, we need to, we, we've looked at this and we think, well, we've got a lot of smaller businesses. I think they probably want to do the right thing, but they, they don't know how. So, you know, we need to bring something as part of the package we offer them to help them their businesses be more sustainable, hopefully more more efficient as well. There's a business case for doing all of this, uh, but it's it's again it's another example of moving away. We're not just there to collect the rent. We've got to get more involved. I think. Yes, those days are kind of gone. I think yeah. I mean the tenancy engagement. So we when we did our carbon footprint, we know that over something like about 65 percent of the carbon emissions across our portfolio are in the tenanted spaces. Well, that brings us sort of perfectly really to a, another topic, which is how we cope with this move from famine to, uh, to, to feast in terms of data availability and the things that we, we know are issues, but how we, how we deal with this. You know, there are so many different businesses out there trying to collect data, actually collecting data, collating data, analyzing data, and putting out different and sometimes competing statistics or conclusions. How, how, do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, how have you decided what to spend time on, what not to spend time on? I mean, it occurs to me that you could, you could you know, double, triple, quadruple the number of people and the amount of resource that you have devoted to this data analysis and still not satisfy everybody. So how, what, are you, what are you actually doing in practical terms to, to wrestle with that question? Uh, that is actually a true challenge because uh, we are receiving, I, I, I believe, more or less every second day questions from investors or research firms about different K KPIs within sustainability, within equality, with everything within ESG. And of course, it takes time to answer all these questions that we are receiving and we don't even know where does this go. Yeah. So I think that is... Um, to have a, a same definitions and to have a, a, a aligned way of reporting and just report once and not every day, that would be very helpful because it's not there that we are making any good, it's in the reality that we are making good. Uh, so this reporting and data gathering, it, it, it's a challenge for a company. And as you are saying, we're not that many. I mean, we're 110 people uh, at our company, so we, we can't have those resources. It, it, sorry, go on. Well, I was going to say, it is. It was becoming a sort of data tsunami, really. We're all being swamped by it, the things we can now, uh, the data we can now collect. So um, there, there needs to be some leveling, leveling of the playing field as much as we have some rules around valuations and stuff like that. We need to create some sort of metrics that will be measured against. But of course, no two businesses are the same. You know, Hammerson is very different from Shaftesbury, and, and so it goes on. But I think you. I don't, I don't know the answer to this, but I think you perhaps you can get sucked down into data. You've got to sort of rise above it. And maybe the most important thing to do is start to see whether the business is starting with the right culture and values. Are they really sincere about what they're doing? Can they give you some measurable examples of things they've done? Um, the data's all there, and we'll find a way through all of that. But I think you go back to the, the sort of culture that sits above all of this. You know, if you spend a little time, you soon see whether businesses are taking this really seriously or not. I, that, that's a that's a good point, but certainly you know our investors, 
uh, our, our own clients, you know, they, they like data. They talking about things in terms of narrative and anecdote and qualitative terms isn't always enough. They want quantitative data and analysis. And, and so I suppose the, the mm. question is, how does one address the need for that yeah. quantitative analysis? Well, I think obviously you start with, a, with the, the EPRA Sustainability Best Practice Reporting Standards. Oh, obviously. Right. <laughs> well done, well done. That Gold sounds star. looking at good, me. Good plug, good plug. Um, but I think, I mean, we do a lot of reporting. Um, and it, it's like, it, it's a market that is emerging. And as you say, we've gone from, 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 from sort of, get it right, famine to feast in terms of the amount of data that, that's available. Sustainability, climate change is something that I, you know, I've been working in this for 15, 16 years. It has completely changed very fast. And suddenly there is this expectation that you're going to have perfect data and be able to kind of give it to you. It's, it, it's, it's a really complicated topic. And I, this is a conversation I have with our, with our finance team when my finance director gets kind of frustrated that the, the carbon numbers have changed again, Louise. Um, and it's like, you have 200 years of accounting, rules, history, and standards. We are making this work now. We are trying to get the right data. We have utilities companies that just will not give us the accurate billing. We have old buildings. I mean, our buildings are old. Yours are even older. The metering that's set up in these buildings, you know, just is not fit for purpose if you're wanting to actually have really accurate data. So it's a work in progress. In any market that develops like that, I think you end up with a lot of businesses and consultants who will say, I can solve that for you. I've got a magic box, and it'll tell you exactly what you want to know. That's just the way markets work. You need, as a business, to be really on the details of what's relevant data for you and what then the investors need to talk about. And you can do that, but it takes a lot of effort. And the investors then need to not expect just to be able to be given one number that says this company is better than that company. There needs to be some investment from that side in understanding what the metrics you're actually using well, are genuinely we'll, telling you. We'll, we'll come to that uh, exact question in just a second, but Biliana, I think you no, want to I, I totally ag agree. And, um, uh, but I think on the other hand, uh, the digitalization uh, that we see in, uh, happening in our industry, connecting all of our properties, measuring everything from how many people are in the room, how many people are entering, exiting, if, uh, are the lights on or not, that will also help us to uh, uh, run our businesses better and to be able to provide uh, data to investors and others. Uh, so, so there is a, a great work ahead of us in, in that field as well. Great. Well, Louise, coming back to that, that question that you touched on just then, I mean, it, it does take two to tango. You know, mm. you, you, this needs to be a discussion and a, and a conversation. And what people like me and others are asking you for uh, is, is going to be part of that. So I suppose, you know, blunt question, are we as investors engaging enough with you? Is it clear what we as investors want? Are we even asking about these things? I mean, you know, we, we all make a great big thing of it. You know, I've told you about our build-up of cost of equity, but, you know, are, are we actually sort of living that, uh, that, um, that theory? How, well, often, how often do you get asked? Well, I was just going to go back over my 30-odd years of being on the board of Shaftesbury, and I could probably count the number of times. I may need two hands, but not necessarily to count. Yeah, up until and probably think, 18 months ago, it yeah, was no hands. All of a sudden, <laughs> uh, we've come a long way, because actually in our results presentation last week, we had a couple of slides on ESG. You know, people in the audience almost fainted. Or what's this got to do with me? Um, there is a disconnect between the groups of people you see. I will say that, uh, you know, the fund managers will talk about the financial performance. I'm not sure there's much co consideration of wider matters and then you go off and do, see a different totally different group of people which i'm not normally asked to be part of anyway so there is a sort of disconnect there but there shouldn't be because i think the two you know the value and long-term value in any business is going to, has, going to have to now encompass esg well i mean it, that, that that fact totally conflicts with what i thought we all agreed only 25 minutes ago which was that these things go to risk they go to return so they're mm. they're one and the same you can't divorce mm. these esg discussions from discussions about the balance sheet or the profit and loss account i don't doubt any fund manager i'm seeing at the moment on our road show will read much of our 140 page annual report where most of these things are discussed it's just about financial performance 
But I must say that the questions are coming. Uh, two years ago, there were no questions about ESG in any investor meeting. Uh, and now it is. And it's more and more. Uh, so I think it's developing rapidly also on the investor side and the interest from investors to understand what we are doing, how, what kind of goals do we have, how are we measuring our progress, etc. So, so it's rapidly growing. But it shouldn't be a bolt-on to financial performance, though the thing you talk about the last five minutes when everybody's looking at their watch. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, we've, we're doing the investor meetings at the moment. I know that th th it has, it does come up, certainly in the last 18 months, it started coming up in the meetings that, that, that David, my chief executive, has with, um, with investors when they're doing their, their results roadshow. So it's definitely much more on the agenda. Um, it's analysts' meetings generally, um, it's still pretty rare. We've been uh, out doing some work with the, the, my IR team, and interestingly, we've had very strong take-up for um, specific meetings about ESG, and not just from the ESG specialists within the investment firms this time, but actually from the investors this time, but actually from the fund managers as well. As well, And you get, you know, you get different levels of engagement, different levels of understanding, but there is much more of it, but it is... It's, I would say there's, there's still a relatively select bunch, um, but it's, it's moving, but we need much, much more of that, and there needs to be much more integrated. And I think the, the requirements around that we've got now around um, TCFD, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, is starting to, I think, will push in that direction because it's, making, it's articulating so much more clearly that climate is a risk that your business needs to understand, and the investors are coming back and saying, okay, so actually what does this really look like? I, I, I mean, from, from my side, I have felt firsthand an enormous shift in the last 12 months. And in fact, I'd say that's accelerated even in the last three months or so. I mean, over 2019, I'd say well over half of the inbound inquiries that we have had have included some aspect of ENS and G. N not always does the end investor actually know precisely what they want. They want, you know, Give me any an ESG. Sorry, what do you mean? Give me an ESG. I want it, an ESG. Yes, yes. Right. Give it to me now. Okay, let's in one number that I can understand. But, 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 but there's a there's a range of understanding. Some some are enormously sophisticated. They know what they want. But others are, are just beginning to wrestle with this uh, with this concept. Okay, so um, I want to leave plenty of time for Q and A. So uh, stand by to sort of uh, to ask some questions. Please don't be shy. Um, but I wanted to just throw one last thing in, which actually comes from my 16-year-old daughter, who I, rather bizarrely, had a conversation with last night about what I was going to be doing today. And she is, like, uh, like most 16-year-olds, uh, enormously driven and, and passionate about lots of things, all things, frankly. Um, but she's, she's, she is very passionate about the environment and, uh, and, and social issues. And what she said that I should ask is how many of you have given up meat and dairy? Because her claim is that the most impactful thing that an individual can do if they believe in the environment and environmental sustainability is to give up meat and dairy. And I know this is a very controversial topic and there have been lots of documentaries in the UK and debate and discussion. But um, on behalf of my daughter, let me just ask, are, are any of you vegans or transitioning towards veganism, plant-based diets? Uh, I have two daughters, so we have definitely these discussions, I can promise you. And yes, we have actually decided uh, to have a at least two days in the week uh, where we don't eat uh, uh, meat or fish eggs, actually. Just eat uh, vegetarian food. Uh, so definitely on our agenda. Yeah, likewise. Interestingly, Hassan's giving me another look here because Hassan and I have a conversation ahead of this session and I, went, I don't quite know whether how this is what turned out today, where I say, we need the lunch at the EPRA Sustainability Committee to be vegetarian. <laughs> so we'll see. You can check whether or not that actually landed this time. We're spinning, giving the thumbs up. So yes, we have a vegetarian lunch today. And I, I, I could completely can sympathize with your daughter's point, and she's absolutely right. And yes, we are we're pretty much in the same situation as you are. One of my sons is, um, he eats fish, but he won't eat meat. And, and I, you just eat much less of it, and you discover that actually two or three days a week you're not eating. But I certainly haven't transitioned to vegan. Um, it's the cheese. <laughs> but, <laughs> 
Mouse. Oh. You need to discover Mouse, M-O-U-S. <laughs> they, they produce some wonderful sort of cheese alternatives. They use the same uh, um, sort yeah. of fungi and whatever to, to, to oh, produce oh, the, the yeah. blue bits, whatever they are. <laughs> yeah. Not very but I, 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 I agree. agree. And, and it is, it's, it's, it's massive. It is controversial. But, you know, if you are... It, it's the, the mass consumption that we have as a society, particularly Western society, of meat that's mass-produced, the, the, the impact of it is just unsustainable in every way. Yeah. Um, beyond not being prepared to give up my Sunday roast, because that is the sort of highlight of the week, really. It's generally a meat-free uh, time for the rest of the week. Uh, but actually, we're seeing more vegan restaurants appearing. We've got over 300 restaurants, bars, cafes across the portfolio. Uh, vegan, is, vegan concepts are coming along. Most restaurants will have a vegetarian option on them now, whereas once upon a time they never did. But it's going beyond that. We've created this sort of quality mark blue turtle uh, scheme about thinking about the sourcing of all food, really, but particularly uh, seafood. And you know, the overfishing is becoming a real problem everywhere. Um, so I think that's responding to what people are looking for. And you're, you're the next generation coming through is going to expect all of this. Yeah. We were in Paris last week, and actually, even in Paris, there was a, there was a restaurant with a vegetarian option. <gasps> wow. I know. Goodness we were me. all shocked. Okay. It's right. getting per serious, folks. It really is getting serious, absolutely. Okay, so a perfect time to transition to Q&A. I don't know whether we've got some roving microphones or whether it's standing. We have got roving microphones. So who would like to kick us off with a question for the panel? Um, if you look at the three components, E, S, and G, what we are more concerned about within the real estate industry is E, um, normally. Um, however, the only one that consistently drove performance in a positive way was S, especially during the crisis. And I guess it goes down to the behavior of the financial industry and then the need to be compliant with social aspects. So then what I'm asking, and, and we are doing now uh, work for EPRA to try and understand what is the link between SBPR and financial performance. So it'll, it'll come out soon uh, n next year. Um, but m my question to you is, within your company, what are you more concerned with and what are the actions you're taking towards E, S, and G, and whether you see that there is an impact in terms of financial performance in the long term, I guess, more than in the short term. Right, complicated question, but uh, let's, let's <laughs> yeah. see. We've got 10 minutes left, and we want to get some other questions. Let's yeah. see if we can summarize some of those, some yeah. of those issues. I, I suppose, Charles, we work in quite a small part of the universe, really. But we do have around us, while everybody thinks it's a huge commercial uh, business location, there, we have a community of residents around us who really are important because they give the, the West End and so her a particular sort of feel. So the S for us is engaging with that community to try and explain with them to them, actually, we are a responsible landowner. Uh, we try and do the right things. We help out the local community. And then when we come to them and ask for, ask for planning consents or things which they're perfectly entitled to object to, they might understand that uh, as a responsible business, uh, the things we're proposing are quite sensible. So it's getting people on your side. And I'm afraid this industry does not have a great reputation generally amongst the general public. Um, it's partly led by Again, we, we talk about in Westminster, you know, if we're going to do something, what's the, what's the resident's dividend? And actually, for what, all that we do, what do we create for society here? And there's a sense we're probably, well, there's, a, there's another expression going, doing the rounds, um, really focused on the developers. And those are their mentalities, buy, build, and bugger off. So actually, we create buildings, but the owners, the people who create those buildings are not there to, see, to understand the legacy of those buildings. And people have to live with them for the next 50 or however many years. So it's thinking about that and engaging those people within our industry. It's a bit of a closed club, really, to a lot of people. Mm, I think that's true. Um, the, as I said, your point, Janneke, is you're doing research, really, that's essentially backwards looking. Um, and if you look at what was going, if you, if you look at sort of property companies or you look at the market, if you're going back to the, the, the crash, you're going back to, what, 2008. And I think there was a very different there was a very different market and there was a very different level of development in terms of our understanding of, of the of environmental impacts it was it was it was growing but i would i would certainly not have expected to be priced in in any way 
And it's always been the, 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 the challenge around any of the research that says, okay, let's see if we can find a link between, between ESG and, and, and property value or company value or, or anything else. Actually, how do you really hold for all of the other things that are affecting asset value and company value at the same time that you go, oh, well, this is actually specifically because of the environment or that their policies around environmental performance, this happened, or the thing that you did to this building around environment, this happened. It, the market is going to be affected by so many other things, it becomes pretty meaningless. So you can't, so to some extent, and particularly for our industry, you need to be, we need to be much more forward-looking about it because it's, that's where climate change is coming from. That's where the risk is coming from. How are these businesses really set up to form, perform over the next 10, 15, and 20 years? And are there, are, do you think as an investor, their policies and their approach and their culture within that business um, is going to be one that's going to be able to actually operate in an incredibly challenging business environment from a number of different directions. So to some extent, I'm unfortunately going to say, I think you're asking the wrong question. <laughs> but, it, but, but, but nonetheless, it is a question that will continue to be asked because yeah. your hard-nosed investor is going to want to know categorically, should I be spending time and resource on this? Should, should my companies that I'm investing in be spending time and resource on this, you know, does it go to value? And, and I think, again, we've got the narrative, we've got the anecdotes, we can discuss it and talk about it, but actually having that, that really hard-nosed data for when you go off and you know, see the, the hedge fund manager who just cares about the bottom line and quantitative stuff, um, it, is, it is difficult to it's true, understand but then it, where that question yeah, comes but from. Yeah, but I mean, but, but, it's, but it's also that they want to know that, that bottom line, and there is the, 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 the stuff that we've talked about here earlier, and just those, those basic numbers that we've talked about earlier. You can see all of that, and you can see that in the reporting, which is where the reporting standards come, come through. And I think there is, there is increasing alignment around the, the reporting standards that we use about, the, the, about energy demand and our, and, our, and our carbon emissions and everything else. You know, most businesses are reporting to a very kind of you know, to, to, those, to, to those standards now. So that data is there. Um, and you can immediately, you, you're, we are starting to see this and the, 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 the expectations of the market. Um, so I think it is there. Um, and I think it will start, it, it's, it's, it's simply going to go in one direction. But to be expected to look back over the last 10 years and say, was it there? We, we're only getting questions in the last 18 months. And, and it's actually, you can't say because we have reduced our energy consumption by, by 20% over five years' time, uh, we know how much we have saved on the cost side. Uh, we know if we are saving on the cost side, then our value of the properties goes up. But what does it do with our profitability on a long-term basis? You, you cannot just you know, carve out one thing and try to find uh, how it affects the profitability. It's uh, the whole thing. I mean, for an example, uh, People working at Kungsleden, they, they love to work with sustainability in all aspects. Uh, and because of that, we have higher satisfaction with our employees. And if we have higher satisfaction with our employees, they will do a better job. And if it, they do so, our customers, our tenants, will be more satisfied. And they will stay with us, they will pay higher rent, etc. So it's a chain of things that all goes hand in hand, and you can not just carve out one thing and try to measure it somewhere else. You certainly can't prove the negative in all of this. You can't no. prove the effect of not doing things. Yeah. Uh, but I think it comes back to judging. Judgment's required here. You need to meet people, look at what they're doing. Is it in their culture to address these issues or just try and dodge them? Okay. Uh, I'm afraid you can't reduce it all to a spreadsheet, a set of numbers. Okay, great, right. Um, is there another question? Yes, question here just towards the front. You, in your company, for example, do you have an ESG dedicated team, or people, or I don't know, ambassadors? Or is it something disseminated among all departments? I don't know. And uh, for everybody, all your employees have some ESG KPIs to achieve. How does it work in your organization? Well, I speak as the smallest business here with only 34 people, soon to be 35, and the 35th person is we're finally going to get ahead of sustainability, where we've all tried to do it ourselves, and uh, we, need a bit, well, <laughs> we, we need to bring things together with somebody with some experience. So uh, that's a step forward. So it, it is embedded in everything we do. But quite interesting, our annual, annual bonus metrics now have been changed for the year ahead, so whereas it, it was there's a, a, a weighting to all certain aspects of the business, while it was 10% 
investment around sustainability is now 20% this coming year, and that may be 30% the year after that. I don't know, but there's a direction of travel there. So we do think about it all the time, but there is you know, going to influence our financial reward. And you do now have some dedicated resource, or some, certainly somebody who has a, has a, has a title... Yes, we've all done it. I mean, it's great that everybody, because everybody gets involved, but it needs, it's getting beyond us now to do it individually as sort of slightly well-meaning amateurs in all of this, but we've taken it very seriously for a long time. But even we now to, we need to invest in somebody new that's going to draw it all together and move us on from what and we've done. And Biliana, dedicated team? Yeah, not a team. We have a head of ESG. Uh, and I think that, that I would actually argue that it's important not to have a team somewhere there who is working with these questions because then you will not get involvement from all the others. For us it has been super crucial to get everyone to work with the ESG. Uh, it's from our board to the management team and everyone working at Kungsleden. That has been our way of doing it. We do have a team. I have a, there's a, including me, there's a team of six at, uh, corporately, and there's no way we would be able to deliver the program that we deliver without having a team. We also have somebody who has specific responsibility within each of the assets, um, uh, so within the operational teams on the ground, who has specific responsibility to make sure that that asset is able to deliver the, its targets as well. So I think um, I have somebody who's responsible for, 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 for the data. You know, we have, we have data coming in monthly into, into our systems. It's, this, there's a huge amount that comes across comes from the portfolio. So um, I report directly to our chief executive. But I think, and to, to go to your point about it, it can't be just the team that, 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 that does it, um, there are objectives um, that go straight back to kind of performance um, metrics for um, all of the senior team, which then kind of feed into all of their all of their direct reports as well. Because whilst we have a team, there's no way we can deliver the kind of change that we do without everybody, without the project managers, and without the technical service managers on site, without everybody understanding that they have to play their role. You know, we've got a target to be net positive for our carbon emissions by 2030. There's no way that's in my gift. That's only in the gift of the teams who are actually making this happen on the ground. So yeah, we do have dedicated team. Comes back to culture, values, and purpose. It should be embedded in all of those. Great, we've got time for one quick question, sir. The question that I wanted to ask is about standards, actually. Having spent a little bit of time trying to educate myself on the various different standards that are available in the industry, I'm more confused than ever. So um, I think this was sort of mentioned before, like investors need to invest time in under trying to understand this issue. But if you invest the time, you're not getting any closer to the answer, right? It just raises more questions. So here's my question for you. In the Brexit uh, world that's coming up in a few years' time, hopefully, will BREAM still be a leading standard in a European landscape? It depends what you, what you want your standards to do. I mean, BREAM is, a, is a, essentially was designed as a, a standard for new construction. It certainly has moved that market and it's evolved. And it has very clear, very obvious similarities with other international standards within, with lead ratings and other things. So, so I would expect there to, 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 to still be some, some standard that we are expected to, 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 to build to, but it will have to evolve if that's going to be the case. Um, I don't think Brexit or, or, any, or, or any of those whatever's going on geopolitically really makes much of a difference because it's the business community that is interested in understanding the standards of the buildings that they're, they're, they're moving into. I think where, where Briam will have to evolve and where the industry will have to evolve is actually understanding more about the operational performance of buildings rather than the built quality because the build quality is significant, is important and in terms of the actual embodied carbon, but actually it's how that building operates over the course of its life and making sure that it is, it, it is performing for a very long time that makes the difference. Unless others in our panel have a sort of a, 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 sort of a, a burning desire to add something to that, we, we've got the blinking red light there. I could do us. half an hour on Brexit, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> well, there'll, there'll, be, uh, there'll be plenty of time, I'm sure, to, uh, to, to discuss this further during the rest of the day, but um, for now, we, uh, we better end this panel. Thank you very much to Louise and Brian and Biliana, and thank you all for, uh, for, for joining us.